suffered from two mothers, and representatives of the Saudi government, and so officials from the state like and justice spray, departments. Yeah. This part of the hearing is about two hours, ten minutes. Do you all swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Have a seat. We've heard uh, lengthy testimony from you, Ms. McLean and Ms. Roush, in the past. Uh, you, so if you could uh, keep your testimony, I'd like to try to keep everybody to five minutes today if I can so we can get to questions. So we'll start with you, Ms. McLean. Can, can you turn the mic on there, please? Okay, pull it, it pull, pull, pull it closer to you, please. Thank you. Chairman Burton and members of the Government Reform Committee, it was clear to everyone who was present at these hearings last week that the Saudis' Washington public relations firms have further damaged their credibility. Dodging this committee's subpoenas was an inexcusably cowardly act. If these firms and their clients at the Saudi Embassy have no criminal activity to hide, then what, the, what are they so afraid of? In the wake of 9-11, these firms have already learned that their association with the criminal enterprises of the Saudis have begun to cost them dearly in terms of their reputations. The spate of recent defec defections from Corvus by some of the firm's brightest minds should be an indication of troubles to come. There's an old saying where I come from, you lie down with dogs, you get fleas. My own relationship with the Saudis entangled me in their web of deceit and violence, but these public relations firms are not looking past the dollar signs in their dealings with an extremely demonic and virulent entity. Patton Boggs, Corvus, and the Gallagher Group are in bed with a family reminiscent of the crime families that once held decent Americans hostage. My daughter Heidi and I have lived as hostages of the Saudis for several years, but after 9-11, our whole country has been prey to their Machiavellian schemes. These public relations firms imagine themselves to be immune from the Saudis' venomous aims, but let me disabuse them of that notion. The Saudis have a long history of letting others do the dirty work for them, leaving their partners on the short end of any deal. When I appeared here a week ago, I was most encouraged by the remarks of Senator Blanche Lincoln from my home state, wherein she announced new legislation to deal with Saudi and any other child stealers. Senator Lincoln spoke of proposed legislation which would make it mandatory for the State Department to deny U.S. visas not only to the kidnappers, their accomplices, and their families, but to their employers as well. My child's kidnapper is employed at the Aramco Oil Company. I would be only too glad to see all the Saudi Aramco employees stationed at the huge complex in Houston expelled. In addition, any Aramco personnel from Dahran with plans to travel to the U.S., including the CEO, Mr. Al Juma, could be kept out of our country under such legislation. Mr. Al Jaber from the Saudi Embassy has given his PR advisors a mandate to try to resolve what he calls child custody issues. This is a ridiculous statement meant to act as a distraction. PR firms are not law enforcement and thus hardly qualified to handle kidnappings. Their job is to spin the news in their client's favor, and their real mandate is to make the whole embarrassing issue of the Saudi Embassy's complicity in child stealing disappear. Mr. Al Jaber needs to be informed that there is no child custody issue in my daughter's case. I have legal custody, and my ex-husband willingly signed a divorce and custody decree issued in an American court. The kidnapper held legal residency status in the United States and so placed himself under the jurisdiction of American law and even swore an oath of loyalty to the United States. In this oath, he denied his allegiance to the Saudi royals. Any involvement of Saudi finance PR firms in my daughter's case is a blatant conflict of interest and therefore out of the question. Furthermore, Mr. Al Jaber's suggestions that the National Center on Missing and Exploited Children should be involved in negotiations for my daughter's life is totally off base. I ask if anyone here has wondered why Al Jaber has been touting the accomplishments of the international section at the National Center. There are personnel at the National Center who are or have been on the Saudi Embassy payroll. 
who have had access to the records of our missing children, who have stabbed various parents in the back at one time or another, and I reject the involvement of these Saudi plants at any cost. Mr. al Jaber went on at length about a bilateral solution to these kidnappings. Who are these bilateral players he's talking about? Translated into ordinary English, he means that the criminals at the Saudi embassy, their hired guns at the PR and detective firms, their plants in the NCMEC, their pro-Saudi friends at the State Department, and the fugitive Saudi kidnappers themselves will be dictating all the terms. Basically, Al Jaber's plan just gives the criminal who stole my daughter a get-out-of-jail-free card. I do not believe that our government should negotiate with criminals. Nothing short of the unconditional return of our American children is acceptable. These matters are criminal cases, not child custody disputes. If Saudi Arabia is serious about resolving these cases, then they must send our children home immediately and arrest and extradite the kidnappers for trial in the United States. My daughter's kidnapper faces multiple county, state, federal, and Interpol charges for which he must be held to account. In the past, the Saudis' mouthpieces have intercepted my emails, threatened Pat Roush, Monica Stowers, Maureen Deba, and me. They invade our privacy and keep voluminous files on all of us, which they dutifully turn over to their Saudi handlers. This brings me to one of the most disturbing aspects of the recent behavior of Corvus, Patton Boggs, and the Gallagher Group. In reading the subpoenas issued to representatives of the three firms, I came across most distressing information that these firms, at the instigation of the Saudis, have apparently engaged the services of private detectives to dig up dirt on the parents of their kidnapped victims in an attempt to harass, intimidate, and victimize us further. Perhaps this explains the mysterious hang-up phone calls in the middle of the night, the hacking of our computers and web pages, and the Arabic-speaking phone stalkers that have been pursuing some parents. In the wake of our 1998 announcement that we would be boycotting Aramco's partner, Texaco, one of our missing children's websites was accessed thousands of times from inside Saudi Arabia and then repeatedly hacked. That's when the harassment from PR began. Coincidence? I think not. I am beginning to feel like the rape victim under cross-examination by the rapist lawyer. That's how I feel about the rapacious Saudi embassy and their lackeys. They take sadistic pleasure in torturing and enslaving innocent women and children and then twisting the knife in the wound. While cash flows from the Saudi embassy to kidnappers and terrorists, the wives of present and former U.S. officials have paid a courtesy call on the Saudi ambassador's wife to commiserate with her in her embarrassment. Ms. Her McLean. embarrassment. Ms. McLean. C could you sum up? Because, like I said, I want to make sure we try to stay as close to five minutes as possible. But thank you. Yes, I will. Um, just thank you. a minute. Mr. Al Jaber bemoans the fact that the attitude of Americans toward his country is bordering on hate. Let me remind the Saudi embassy that the murder of American civilians, the teaching of hate against us in their schools, their espionage on American victims, their refusal to cooperate with the government reform committee, and the stealing and selling of our women and children. These are not conducive to a big love fest between us and the Saudis. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McLean. Ms. Roush. Good morning. I don't have a prepared statement this morning, but I would like to make a couple of points. First of all, Ms. Diane Andrick, I see, is on the witness list. She's representing the State Department. She's the same little lady who sat here in the last couple of hearings with her little scarves on and her little pert hairdos. And in the meantime, she was the hatchet job lady for my daughters and gave the order for these characters to my left to be able to do that little deed they did to my daughters in London. I would like for the committee to address Ms. Andrick and ask her why she, did, she gave the order when Adel Jaber requested it for the American Embassy to send someone to that hotel in London to interview my daughters without my knowledge when Randy Carlino called me and asked me for my permission to make this happen and I said no and they went ahead and did that anyway. The second point I'd like to make is there is a letter here addressed to um, committee chairman by um, Miss Leslie Kiernan who's the representative of Mr. Petrozzolo from Zuckerman Spader. In the letter she says that the committee, um, Mr. Petrozzolo will appear but she objects to the way that the committee treated Mr. Petrozzulo the last time he was here. 
I'm wondering if Ms. Kiernan and Mr. Petrozillo and the Patton Boggs representative and Jamie Gallagher realize what they've done to my daughters. And if, if they object to Mr. Petrozillo and the others being here, as exemplified by last week's uh, little shenanigans with him running away, with all of them running away from federal marshals, what have they got to hide? And do they ever think about, do they ever keep, does it ever keep them awake at night, what they've done to my innocent daughters? And they object to being here and being asked some questions from the committee concerning this dastardly deed? I think not. Um, what are they hiding and why won't they produce these documents? I believe that these documents are so incriminating that we can trace evidence to Prince Bender and to Adel Jaber. Adel Jaber is the spin doctor uh, who's referred to in the Weekly Standard this week under the article Spin Doctors as a lying son of a bitch. I think he's a pathological liar and a menace to America and he's caused me and my family a great deal of pain and he should be held responsible for this and he should be kicked out of the United States persona non gratis. And Petro Zulu, the people from Patton Boggs and Jamie Gallagher should be held responsible for what they did to my daughters. But I can tell you one thing, Mr. Chairman, the clock may, they may think the clock's going to run out for you, but the clock will never run out for me. I'm going to bring this to world forums, and my book is coming out in a film, so help me God, the clock will never run out, and they will be held responsible one way or the other. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Roush. Mr. Petrozillo. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Michael Petrozello. I'm the managing partner of Corvus Communications, an outside communications firm for the Saudi Embassy in Washington. I'm here today in response to the committee's subpoena. As I explained when I testified before the committee in October of this year, Corvus Communication was hired late last year to assist the Saudi Embassy on media and communication matters in the United States. The vast majority of our communications work is related to the war on terrorism and bilateral U.S.-Saudi relations. We do not set or implement policy. I understand that I'm being asked to testify today regarding Corvus's response to the committee's document subpoena and the Vienna Convention. I'm not an attorney, and I'm not the person at Corvus who is responsible for comp subpoena compliance. In addition, I'm not an expert on the Vienna Convention. As I understand it, Council has advised the committee that the Royal Embassy of Saudi Arabia has asserted that the documents are protected by the Vienna Convention, as well as other legal privileges. Pending a resolution of these legal issues between the Embassy and the committee, Corvus cannot produce the documents. I do not believe I can add anything to com the committee's consideration of these legal matters. Furthermore, as the committee is aware, I have already testified at great length regarding the underlying child abduction issue. Before closing, I would like to respond to the accusation that I acted improperly by not appearing at the hearing last week. Nothing could be further from the truth. I worked all day Tuesday and tried to prepare for the hearing in the event I was called, and I did not evade service. I was home Tuesday night and Wednesday morning. With that, I'll answer any questions I can. The U.S. Marshal came to both your office and your house. Would you say you were home? I was not home at that t when they came to my house. Well, we'll ask your colleagues uh, from the other PR firms where they were, too, because all three of you were missing, couldn't find you, but we'll take you at your word. Mr. Deshauer. Mr. Chairman, Dr. Weldon, I am John J. Deshauer, Jr., an attorney at the law firm of Patton Boggs. The Embassy of Saudi Arabia retained us in November of 2001 to provide them with legal advice and counsel regarding developments within the executive and legislative branches of the U.S. government affecting the United States-Saudi Arabian bilateral relationship. In June of this year, after your committee held its first hearing on the subject of international child custody cases and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, we were specifically asked to counsel the government, again through the embassy, on the legal issues concerning the subject of child custody and to provide advice to the government of Saudi Arabia on ways to bridge the gap between two very different legal systems in ways that protect the interests of the children in question and help to reunite them with their families. At the outset, let me acknowledge that it has been this committee's personal involvement and public hearings that have brought this very serious issue to the forefront. At the same time, as a parent myself, I have read every word spoken by the parents who have testified before this committee. I can only begin to imagine the pain that these people have suffered in these cases. While we are advising our client on the legal issues involved, I cannot, nor will I, 
cannot nor will not put out of my mind the harrowing stories that these parents have told. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia believes international child custody is a serious global problem. It is the position of the Saudi government has made in their public statements that every effort must be made to develop a resolution that protects and promotes the interests of the child while recognizing the rights of both parents. Accordingly, our firm has been asked by our client to provide it with legal advice concerning the subject of international child custody, existing and potential multilateral and bilateral frameworks, and possible U.S. Saudi protocols to address these issues. You have asked me here today to testify about the application of the Vienna Convention to the subpoena sent to Patton Boggs on October 10, 2002, by Committee Counsel James Wilson. The subpoena directs a variety of documents relating to this firm's representation of the Royal Embassy of Saudi Arabia. I am not an expert in either the Vienna Convention or the attorney-client privilege. I have attempted to address these issues in my written statement. I would also like to address the circumstances surrounding last week's hearing. I want to make it clear that I am appearing voluntarily, that my inability to appear last week was the result of a last-minute notice and a long-planned personal trip, and that the Embassy in no way instructed or otherwise encouraged me not to appear. I am here voluntarily today and ready to answer your questions within the bounds of my ethical obligations to my client. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Deshauer. Mr. Gallagher? Mr. Chairman, Dr. Weldon, Chancellor. My name is Jamie Gallagher. I'm 39 years old. I'm self-employed. My consulting and lobbying business is the Gallagher Group, LLC. I'm not a lawyer. My counsel, James D. Wareham, is here with me today. For four and a half years, I served as a senior policy analyst for the Republican Study Committee here in the United States House of Representatives. During that period, Mr. Chairman, you served as Study Committee's vice chairman, and I was fortunate to work closely with you and your staff on a wide range of issues. From there, I served as Director of Congressional Affairs of the Defense-Based Closure and Realignment Commission from 1991 and 1993. I then joined the staff of Senator Judd Gregg, your former colleague, as Legislative Director. I subsequently served as his Administrative Assistant and ran his Washington, D.C. office. In 1995, I joined the lobbying firm of Boland & Madigan as Vice President. In January 2000, I left Boland & Madigan to fulfill my entrepreneurial dreams and start my own lobbying and consulting business. On November 15, 2001, I was retained by the Royal Embassy of Saudi Arabia through Corvus Communications, LLC, to advise the Embassy on its relationship with the United States Congress and, to a lesser extent, with the Executive Branch. I often confer with members of Congress and their staff on matters of mutual interest. On October 8, 2002, this committee subpoenaed the Gallagher Group in connection with its investigation of whether any children of Saudi and American parents who are being kept by one parent in Saudi Arabia wish to return to the United States, but have been prevented from doing so. I was not retained by the Embassy to advise, retained by the embassy to advise them on the handling of cases under investigation and have no direct knowledge about any of those cases. Immediately after receiving the subpoena, I gathered all documents requested by the committee. All the documents were prepared or maintained in my capacity as a registered agent of the Embassy. Upon learning of this committee's demand for documents belonging to the Embassy, the Saudi Ambassador wrote me a on October 21, 2002, to request that I refrain from producing the documents to this committee because they are protected by the Vienna Convention. After reviewing analyses prepared by counsel for the Embassy, a letter prepared by the staff of this committee, and consultation with my own counsel, I concluded I must honor the Saudi Ambassador's request. I am not a lawyer, and I know very little about the complexities of the Vienna Convention. The United States Department of State, the Department of Justice, and the Royal Embassy of Saudi Arabia far more competent than I to express a view on the scope of the Vienna Convention. As I understand it, both the Departments of State and Justice believe the Embassy has raised this issue in good faith, and both agencies are in the process of carefully studying the Convention and analogous legal precedents. I hold the institution of the House of Representatives in highest possible esteem. Indeed, I spent many years working as a staff member in this body. I believe firmly, however, that I'm not qualified to address the legal questions addressed by this Committee's effort to obtain access to documents belonging to and reflecting confidential advice provided to the embassy, Saudi Embassy. In addition, I have not been involved in handling the cases that are at the core of this committee's investigation. In conclusion, I am appearing here today to be interrogated on a highly technical legal matter of which I am nearly entirely unfamiliar. I ask the committee to respect the position that I am in and recognize the limited value to be afforded by my testimony. Mr. Gallagher, before we go to Mr. Rosenberg, I'd just like to ask you, you, you don't, do know that when, when 
uh, an agency or an individual gets a subpoena from the United States Congress and they refuse to honor that subpoena, they run the risk of being held in contempt by the Congress. You do understand that? Yes, Mr. Chairman. So I just, I just wanted to make sure you understood that because the Saudi government, even though they're a client of yours and they're asking you not to do that, uh, they have no authority to put you in legal jeopardy. But the subpoena that we've sent does, and we intend to pursue uh, those documents because we think they're very important as far as these, uh, these women and kids are concerned. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Weldon. Uh, my name is Morton Rosenberg. I am a specialist in American public law at the Congressional Research Service of the Library of Congress. Uh, you've asked me here today to address uh, two uh, legal questions that have been raised in your proceedings. Uh, one, your lack of authority to hold this hearing and to issue subpoenas during an adjournment of, uh, of the Congress and to enforce those subpoenas. And second, uh, you've asked me to uh, uh, say something about uh, the, the efficacy of the attorney-client privilege claims before uh, congressional committees. I've uh, submitted a written statement which uh, in la at length uh, deals with these issues and I'll uh, short, briefly uh, give you my conclusions. Uh, the Patton Boggs assertion to your committee that uh, your committee has no authority to engage in investigative oversight activity after the adjournment synod die of the House appears to lack uh, a substantive basis. It is uh, founded essentially on two Office of Legal Counsel opinions, uh, the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel opinions, which uh, rely essentially on the fact that uh, when Congress adjourns, uh, it can't pass any laws. Uh, and the, uh, from that, they deduce that um, uh, not being able to pass laws, they can't do oversight. They can't investigate. They can't prepare uh, uh, for when Congress comes back in session. Uh, this is, uh, of course, refuted by the fact we're here today. Uh, they must have some evidence of, uh, of your authority. But uh, the House and the Senate, uh, by rules of their respective houses, uh, have authorized all their standing committees to meet, hold investigative hearings, uh, and to issue subpoenas during adjournments and recesses. Uh, those rules are authorized by the Congress, which uh, 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 authorizes each House to uh, promulgate rules for their uh, uh, activities. Uh, the the uh, allowance of committees to um, operate uh, during recesses and adjournments have been recognized uh, as far back as 1790 by Thomas Jefferson uh, in his writings. Uh, indeed, if a, uh, a proper contempt resolution is issued by a standing committee during this adjournment period, it may be reported by the Speaker of the House, who, after due consideration of the committee's report, uh, may forward it to the United States Attorney for the District of Columbia uh, for prosecution. The only pertinent uh, court opinion on the Synodai issue uh, supports your legislative authority. Uh, in that opinion, um, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals vacated an order of a district court which challenged uh, the, the right of a committee to act during a recess, uh, recess and the efficacy of a, uh, of a subpoena and said that uh, that court rather surprisingly denies the right of Congress to conduct business through its committees after it adjourns, even though all adjournment means is that the Congress is in recess. The Congress does not end until the congressional term expires, and in this year it's January 3rd. Uh, with respect to the uh, congressional uh, practice with respect to the uh, uh, common law testimonial privileges, uh, that also has uh, been recognized as being a matter that is in the discretion of the chair and ultimately in the committee uh, that is issuing subpoenas. Uh, your committee um, uh, and other committees, especially over the last 20, uh, this discretion has been recognized since the 19th century, and over the last 25 years has been developed extensively to the extent that uh, committees like yours uh, test each assertion of attorney-client privilege, which is welcomed uh, individually, with particular regard as to whether uh, a court would accept such a claim. On the basis of the record uh, before you, it would appear uh, quite unlikely 
uh, that the three firms retained by the Saudi embassy would meet the high burden uh, necessary to establish such a claim. Of significant import, I believe, uh, is the correspondence with the committee. Uh, the, the correspondence with the committee does not indicate that the firms are doing predominantly legal work for the embassy, but rather lobby, lobbying work or consulting work, which courts have consistently found insufficient uh, to invoke the privilege. You have invited, however, in, in your subpoenas and in your letters, uh, these firms to uh, present privilege logs, which uh, hopefully would establish that uh, they are doing actual legal work for the <coughs> embassy, and those uh, you know, could be considered by you then. As of now, though, uh, it's my understanding uh, that there has been no, no attempt uh, to support their claims. I would be pleased to answer questions about both of these uh, legal issues, uh, uh, if you wish. Thank you, Mr. Rosenberg, and we appreciate always your legal expertise and, and uh, the information you give this committee. Ms. Malo Ms. Mahoney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Maureen Mahoney. I am an attorney at the law firm of Latham & Watkins. I have represented the embassy on issues pertaining to sovereign immunity and diplomatic immunity for over 20 years now. Um, I am predominantly a um, constitutional and appellate lawyer, but I consider myself an expert on these issues. I want to acknowledge at the outset that we understand that these are very important issues for the committee, and they are very important for the United States State Department and for all foreign embassies in the United States and abroad. We don't take lightly the invocation of these privileges. But I've studied these matters in great depth, and I want the chairman to understand that it is personally my opinion that the embassy has properly interpreted the treaty and that it would be a breach of this treaty for the committee to try to hold these consultants and lawyers in contempt for failure to produce the documents that have been requested. I truly believe that. I think it's the right answer, and I think if we litigated this issue, ultimately a court would decide in our favor. I have attached to my testimony two letters that I've written to the committee which explain the legal issues in some great depth, and I would ask that they be entered into the record of this hearing. I'd like to address three basic issues. The first is why I think that our interpretation of the committee of the of the convention of the treaty is the correct one, why it's reasonable, most consistent with the language and purposes. Second, I'd like to talk a little bit about Professor Denz's opinion, which I understand um, you are relying upon quite heavily and explain why I don't think it's persuasive. And third, I'd like to talk a little bit about the issue of what implications our assertion of privilege has here for espionage and terrorist investigations, that sort of thing. Uh, first, I just want to put in the most plain and practical terms what the issue here is. And it's really whether the Vienna Convention, which is a very broad convention that's designed to promote diplomatic relations in the United States, protects an embassy's right to consult with local advisors in this country and in other countries on a confidential basis, whether that's something that the convention is designed to promote. And this answer affects not only the interests of the Saudi embassy, but every embassy here in the United States and the conduct of foreign affairs here and throughout the world. I'd like to make the first point, which is the language of the convention strongly supports the embassy's interpretation in this case in two respects. First, Article 24 does, makes it explicit that the archives and documents of the mission, the documents of the mission are inviolable at any time and wherever they may be. It is not simply documents that are in the possession of the embassy, but also documents that belong to the embassy that are located someplace else. Article 27 says that the United States government, the receiving state, must promote and protect free communication on the part of the mission for all official purposes. That makes it clear that one of the responsibilities of the United States as a nation is to make sure that diplomatic missions can do their job by having free communication, and courts have repeatedly said that means can mean confidential communication if there's a need for it, in order to perform their functions. In addition, 
The express purposes of the Convention are very important because our courts repeatedly say that treaties have to be interpreted in a manner that promotes the purposes of the Convention. And here, the express purpose is to ensure the efficient performance of the functions of diplomatic missions. Those functions are broadly defined to include uh, ascertaining by all lawful means, conditions, and developments in the host country, negotiating with the government of the host country, and promoting friendly relations between both countries. These purposes are directly implicated here. Um, looking at the purposes, I think we have to recognize that, especially for countries that have cultures that are more different than our own, there is a great need to have local expertise, to have American advisors. Now, the embassy could hire these advisors on a part-time basis and have them be at the embassy, but there's no reason in the law why they should be required to do that in order to get their services. Instead, it is commonplace for embassies, and I think for the United States government as well, to hire consultants, local experts, um, on a contractual basis to serve as agents, and that's what they have done here. Um, Chairman Henry Hyde of the House International Relations Committee recently held hearings about the importance of improved public relations to U.S. foreign policy and explained the need to hire these very kinds of experts to help advise the United States how to promote its foreign policy interests throughout the world. So I don't think that the Saudi government is the only government that has a need for outside expertise. The question then really is, is there a need for these communications to be confidential? I think, Mr. Chairman, you recognized before that things work best if there can be um, candid advice from advisors about how to proceed, to make recommendations about what the best course of proceeding in these child custody matters and elsewhere. They can't get that candid advice if they're not going to be able to have conf confidential communications. There is right now, in fact, the United States Supreme Court has said that it is too plain to question whether there is a need for governments to have confidential communications when trying to decide how to proceed. Right now we are in the middle of a circumstance where this committee is investigating these issues and where the Saudi government is attempting to negotiate a resolution with the State Department. And yet the committee says it wants to see the confidential communications that relate to this ongoing diplomatic negotiation. That would seriously undermine the ability of the embassy to get candid and confidential communications. I have to acknowledge that there has not been a United States court that has directly addressed this issue, but that doesn't say that there isn't strong support for our interpretation in a variety of contexts. And the reason it hasn't been addressed, I think, is because it hasn't been done before. Um, I don't believe this committee, or at least I, not that I know of, has ever tested uh, the Vienna Convention in this way before by seeking these kinds of confidential documents from an embassy's consultants. But I think the important thing here is to understand that in a variety of contexts, uh, the executive branch and U.S. courts have recognized the need for confidential communications when deliberating about issues of diplomatic negotiations. This goes all the way back to 1796 when George Washington refused to provide information to Congress relating to ongoing diplomatic negotiations and said that these kinds of negotiations often depend on secrecy and a full disclosure of all the measures, demands, or eventual concessions which may have been proposed or contemplated might have a pernicious influence. Would, would, would the gentlelady yield just a moment? Wasn't George Washington, in effect, using executive privilege of the president in that case? Yes, he was. Well, this is, we're not talking about uh, executive, uh, uh, the president using uh, executive uh, authority in this particular case. Mr. Chairman, what we're talking about is a convention that says that the United States government has an obligation to protect and promote free communications for official purposes by a government, by a sovereign. This is a foreign sovereign. And the point here is that as far back as 1796, George Washington told this Congress that it would undermine the operations of the United States government to share that information, very similar information, with congressional committees, well, even though they were on the same team, well, and yet... Ms. Mahoney, uh, we've gone beyond the five minutes, but, but but you and I can have a little dialogue here because I think it's very important that we go into this in some detail. It sounds like to me that the Saudi Embassy is prepared using you as their legal 
uh, uh, advisor to go to court to try to protect these documents. And, and I can understand that. And whether or not uh, I agree with you or whether or not Ms. Denza agrees with you, who's the foremost expert on the Vienna Convention, the fact of the matter is this could be tied up in court for a long time and uh, this could end up being a moot point. So let me just ask you this. Let's just say, for example, just a, that the Saudi embassy and the Saudi government knew something about the 15 terrorists from Saudi Arabia that blew up the World Trade Center and attacked the Pentagon here in the United States. And let's say that there was some correspondence that trans was transmitted between their lobbying firm and the Saudi embassy that may have shed some light on this. And let's just say that there might be some more possible terrorist attacks that might be in the offing that might be enumerated or if not enumerated maybe some information might be in those documents that would lead us to preventing the possible attack that might occur. Are you telling us that because of this privilege we couldn't get that information in the United States Congress? Mr. Chairman, if the Saudi government has retained agents in the United States to assist in, the, in acts of terrorism, that agency relationship would be void for illegality from the get-go. There would be no protection for documents in the possession of the third party under those circumstances. I do not believe that an American court would say that under those circumstances that that was a proper well, agency relationship or that the documents would be okay. uh, the property okay. of the embassy. Okay, that's good. So now we're talking about kidnapped children, kidnapped from the United States. Now, can you tell me the difference? Y yes, Mr. Well, no, Chairman. Wait a minute. Listen, now, we're talking about breaking a law with the complicit support of the Saudi embassy. Uh, in the case of the Terre Haute young woman, her daughters were taken, three of them. The court in, of jurisdiction had contacted the Saudi embassy, told them that they were not to take those children out of the country. They knew of the di divorce decree and who had custody. Uh, they, the, the father said he wouldn't take them out of the country. He went directly to the Saudi embassy, got three passports for the children, and the mother hasn't seen them since they're in Saudi Arabia. Now, that's a kidnapping case. Now, we're talking the difference here between a terrorist case and a kidnapping case, and I want you to define the difference. Mr. Chairman, these consultants and lawyers have not been hired to assist the Saudi embassy in kidnapping. Well, we don't know what's in those transmissions. We don't know what's in that correspondence. Just like if there was a terrorist involvement and that correspondence took place, we wouldn't know that unless we saw the documents. Mr. Chairman, there are a variety of sources of information, and courts often draw lines based on the information that the United States government has. The United States government doesn't have any information that these firms, which have been assisting the Saudi Embassy in responding to your concerns and working with the State Department have been hired as part of an illegal scheme to engage in well, criminal Ms. wrongdoing. Ms. Mahoney, let me just say this. We talked to Mr. Petrozzullo when he was last here, and he said he didn't know anything about a lot of these issues, but when we pushed him, he told us he was involved in the writing of letters, in the writing of all kinds of documents that showed very clearly uh, that uh, that uh, the, the Saudi government was not uh, in involved in any way and was not guilty of, uh, of, of uh, involving themselves in these things. I mean, he was involved, and he said that under oath. He was involved in writing these documents. Now, why, if he was involved in these documents, would that not be a part of the problem? Well, because he wasn't hired to commit illegal acts, Mr. Chairman. That I, I, I don't think there's been any suggestion that there is evidence to indicate that these consultants and no. lawyers have been hired. No, but that's not the point. But he may, through the correspondence he have, be aware, or his firm may have in their possession, uh, evidence about illegal acts, just like if there was a terrorist attack and there was some correspondence that might be relevant to that, they would have that in their files as well. Mr. So I don't see the difference. Mr. Chairman, the embassy could certainly have any embassy, not the Saudi embassy, any embassy in, in the United States could have information that the United States government might like to have, documents that are in their possession or that they own that are located elsewhere. But that doesn't mean 
that the United States government is entitled to have them. It has signed a treaty that says it will respect the protections of the, of the treaty, and those protections require the United States to promote and protect free communication, and they also require them to respect the inviolability of documents yeah. that belong to the embassy, no well, matter I, where I, they're located. I won't belabor this. I will just say that I, I, I have heard of your credentials. I know that you're a very, very brilliant attorney, and you've done an outstanding job over the last several years, many years, and you've represented the Saudi Embassy for a long time, and I think you acquit yourself very, very well. But the fact of the matter is the foremost authority in the world on the Vienna Convention testified last week that she does not agree with your, but you are being paid by the Saudi Embassy, which you've admitted, and I understand you're going to take their position, and I understand that it's likely that uh, if we press this, that you'll go to court to keep the American people from knowing what was in those, th that correspondence. Now, let, let me just go on, because I feel very strongly about this. We have here women who have had their children kidnapped while under a court order to stay in the United States. Their kids have not be, been seen since and may never be seen again. They can't even talk to these kids. Some of these women that I talked to in Saudi Arabia told me that their lives were threatened on a regular basis by their husbands if they didn't walk the chalk and do exactly what they said. If you lived in Saudi Arabia, if you lived there and was married to a Saudi, and he said, don't leave the house, and you did, there's nothing the government could do if he beat the hell out of you and, and made your life a hell on earth. And you're an American citizen. And we've got American citizens over there that are suffering like that right now. And we're trying every way we can to get these kids and these women back. One woman told me she wanted to be put in a box with her kids and sent out of the country in the belly of a plane if necessary. She said anything to get us out of here because of the hell we're living in. And it was not an isolated case. And the bottom line is all of these machinations that are taking place right now by the Saudi government, their lobbyists, and you, I'm sure they're legal, but the point is wrong is being done and they can't get their kids back. And all these roadblocks that are being thrown up, and you're, I'm sure you could throw up a legal roadblock that would tie this thing up, and you probably will for months. And the thing that bothers me is nothing's going to be done about these kids or these women. Nothing. And you keep saying the State Department is responsible for doing that. Well, I agree they should be putting pressure on them, but they haven't done anything. And our Justice Department isn't doing anything. And, and God forbid the administration really hasn't done much, and I have high regard for it. But the fact of the matter is these kids aren't coming home. They're American citizens. We had one case where a woman went to get her kids, took them to the embassy, said, this is American soil. We want our kids to go. We want to go to America. And the embassy official had a Marine pick the kids up and take them to the front gate. The woman was arrested, and the kids were sent back and the girl was 12 years old, and because there was a reprisal that was going to take place, the father married her off at 12 years old to a man she didn't even know. Now, you know, that sort of thing goes on, and what you're saying now is that the Saudi Arabian government has a legal right for us not to get documents that may or may not prove that they were complicitous in this kidnapping, and kidnapping is a felony, and you're saying that there's a difference between that and, 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 and terrorist activity, and I just don't see the difference. Mr. Chairman, um, this, if the Saudi embassy was complicit by, for instance, issuing a visa, that is not kidnapping under U.S. law. I mean, there is a, a case on this in the Ninth Circuit. It wasn't that, a visa. It was a passport. Well, whatever. I, I mean, I think the point is the same. These are serious issues. They're obviously serious issues. It's commendable for the committee to look into them, but at the same time, it is the responsibility of the United States government to honor its obligations under the treaty to go about its processes in a way where it, it acquires the information in a manner that's consistent with the treaty. The Saudi government has offered to, um, to provide information in a variety of different ways. And I have to say, Mr. Chairman, I was very troubled 
by the letter that I received from counsel for your staff today and by the opening comments that essentially said that the fact that I have tried to reach some sort of compromise that would allow the committee to get access to underlying facts without having to disclose the confidential deliberations that are reflected in these documents was an indication that the embassy didn't really care about inviolability after all, that this wasn't really important. Well, let me comment about that letter because I approved it. I approved that letter. So don't blame the council, blame me. Let me just tell you this. The, 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 the embassy said that they would give these documents to a third party and the third party would give us information of those documents that was relevant to our investigation. The problem with that counsel is that we don't know that the third party is going to give us all of the information that's relevant to our investigation. We don't know that the third party is going to be honorable. The Saudi government has paid 200000 to Ms. Petrozalo's firm a month. I don't know how much he's paying to everybody else or you, but I don't know that whoever the third party that would get these documents might not be getting a pretty good hunk of money from them as well. Now, let me just finish. And as a result, this committee trying to find out why these kids are stuck over in Saudi Arabia and these women are stuck over in Saudi Arabia, we might never get the facts. Now, I don't know whether you, you're aware of it, and this is a, a little different subject, but the Saudi uh, embassy and the Saudi government has been uh, uh, faced with a lot of problems lately. One of the problems is after a, a, a suicide bomber blows up themselves, killing a lot of people in the Middle East, they end up paying the family some money because they've gone through some suffering. Also, the Saudi ambassador, Mr. Bendar, to the United States, his wife gave money to some people that was a conduit, we believe, to the terrorists that attacked us on 9-11 at the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Now, both of those things are in question right now. So, you know, we don't have the greatest uh, feeling of, of honesty and integrity coming out of the Saudi embassy. And then we have an expert from the Vienna Convention that says we're entitled to these documents that we have subpoenaed from these lobbyists who are getting two hundred and some thousand dollars a month. And what do we get? We get nothing but a person coming up here who is, whose expertise on the Vienna, question, Vienna Convention may be very good, but you're certainly not known as the foremost authority. But you said very clearly that if this is tested in court, in court, that you feel like your position would be upheld. Now, there's an, imp I know you don't mean it this way, but there's an implied threat there that if we pursue this, this is going to end up in court and it will drag on for months and months and months and maybe years. Now, you know what I'm talking about. You know how the courts are. And so these women and these kids aren't coming home. And the Saudi government, once again, with their money and their stonewalling, will be able to stop the American government through our very good open legal system from getting to the truth and getting to an honest resolution of this. The fact of the matter is, these are American citizens we're talking about who are there against their will, who want to come home, and they can't, and the Saudi government is blocking it, and you're going to do a great job, I'm sure, as you have in the past legally, to make sure that that happens. Mr. Chairman, could I respond for a moment to uh, Professor Denz's opinion? I promise to be brief, but you have referred to her so many times as the leading authority, and I do think it's very important to point out that Professor Denz's opinion about this actually changed several times, um, and that it was not actually firmly grounded in the language or purposes of the convention, and in particular, when you sent a letter sending her opinion in the first instance, you said, Professor Denza believes that the most relevant precedent supports the committee's position. It was a decision by a British court that she had relied upon in her opinion to say that um, any document an embassy voluntarily gives to a third party cannot be the property of the embassy under Article 24. But she actually misread the holding of that case, Mr. Chairman. In fact, the court actually held that the, quote, property in the document, end quote, would pass to a third party recipient, quote, in the absence of any relationship of principal and agent, end quote. That's exactly what we have here, is documents that are passing between the principal and the agent. So the, the case, the one case that she said was relevant actually supports our interpretation, not hers. Well, so, Ms. Mahoney, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not here today to get into the legal arguments that you may be preparing for a court of law. 
and, and we don't have the time to go into all the legal uh, fine points about this. So let me go on and get on with the other questions that we want to ask the, the panel because we're going to be here a long time. We'll get back Thank to you. you with some more questions. Uh, Judge Duncan, did you have a question? Then I'll go to you, Mr. Cummins. I don't really have any questions at this point uh, except to say, Mr. Chairman, that I certainly appreciate your holding this hearing. And in fact, uh, as I've said uh, several times before, I have been so impressed by the issues that you take up. In fact, my, my staff didn't tell me about the hearing in Boston or I would have tried to go up there for that hearing. And I was, as you know, I've been very interested in the subject that you had a hearing on uh, yesterday, but I wasn't able to come. But this is very, very important, the issues that you're dealing with here today. And you know, uh, I spent seven and a half years as a circuit court judge in Tennessee before coming to Congress and several years in law practice before that. And I think one of the things that is, is frustrating or surprising to a lot of people who aren't uh, lawyers, they think that, that the law is all black and white. And it's really not. Uh, most uh, of American law is, is in a, really a gray area. And on most issues, I can find about as many cases even U.S. Supreme Court cases supporting one side as supporting the other. But I will tell you this, and I have to admit, I did not handle a lot of domestic uh, cases. I did some, but that was not an area of the law that I particularly enjoyed. But I will tell you that I know from law school and from the cases that I handled that in the law of domestic relations, it is said over and over and over and over and over again in almost every case that the interests of the child are paramount. That's the main thing that courts are supposed to take into consideration in custody cases or in, in uh, disputes over uh, uh, children, what is in the best interests of the child or what's in the best interests of the children. And I think in this area it is, it is, it is certain and there's no question that it's in the best interest of these children to, to have relationships with both their mothers and their fathers. They're not getting that now. These, we've heard testimony of children that have been uh, taken away in the middle of the night or surreptitiously and, and uh, haven't seen their uh, mothers for many, many years. And we've heard some pretty sad and very compelling testimony. And I can tell you this, it's my strong opinion, and I, I believe that of the chairman also, that our State Department can and should be, could and should be doing a whole lot more in this regard. And if Saudi Arabia is really the ally that they want us to think that they are, then they, the Saudi Arabian government should, be, should and could be doing much more in regard to these uh, children. And so I commend you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. And I hope that we will keep on this, uh, keep on top of this until uh, something more is done to help these children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Judge, could you? Uh, I'm going to need you to take the chair. I have to step out for just a minute. Just a minute, uh, Mr. Cummins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I too uh, want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding these hearings. I think they are extremely important. I was back here on October 3rd and. Um, and I've listened to the testimony of the children, and I agree with you, uh, Congressman Duncan. The, when uh, I practiced law for, for about 20 years before coming to the Congress, and um, a lot of domestic law, and the key phrase is, what is in the best interest of the child? Um, this is a frustrating process for us, um, watching this go on to hear the testimony of mothers who haven't seen their children for years. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm just going to read uh, my statement and, um, and then I'll just listen in. The House Government Reform Committee has held several hearings to look into the recurring problem of abduction of American children to Saudi Arabia. These children, because of Saudi law, are not free to leave Saudi Arabia despite being United States citizens and having a custody order from an American court giving their non-Saudi 
parent custody. Most custody cases in Saudi Arabia are handled by Islamic law, where the father retains legal custody. According to the State Department, there are 47 cases in which more than 90 United States citizens are being held in Saudi Arabia. We meet today to examine the legal arguments the Saudi government has put forth as grounds to, for directing its representatives not to comply with a congressional subpoena. After the October 3rd hearing, Chairman Burton issued document subpoenas to Walrus Communications, Patton Boggs, and the Gallagher Group, the three principal firms representing Saudi Arabia and the country's interest regarding the abduction issue. The subpoena sought the firm's documents regarding their activities on the abduction cases. The three firms have refused to comply with the subpoenas. The primary basis for their refusal to turn over the documents is an instruction by the Saudi ambassador to invoke his government's privileges under the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. They have claimed that their documents are, quote, documents and archives, unquote, of the Saudi Embassy and that such documents in the hands of outside law and public relations firms are protected, quote, documents of the mission, unquote under the treaty. Mr. Chairman, I was very frustrated after that October hearing. Mr. Michael Petru Petruzzello, who is before us again today, could not or would not answer the questions put forth, put forth to him regarding the abduction cases. I hope it is not the case today and that all of the agents of the Saudi government testifying today will be more forthcoming. Last week we heard from Pat Roush and Margaret McLean, who recounted their hardships in trying to secure the return of their children out of Saudi Arabia. I am happy to see them here again today. Mr. Chairman, it is hard to say if parental child abduction is increasing or if the public simply has become more aware of the problem. I believe that by shining the spotlight on parental abductions of American children to Saudi Arabia by this committee, will bring this issue to the forefront and persuade the State and Justice Departments to reevaluate their policies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. What we're going to do at this point, we're going to take a very brief about five-minute break until the uh, Chairman uh, Burton can return. Thank you very much. There's no win at these. I'm going to ask some questions that may may not seem relevant at the outset, but th there's a reason for them, so I hope you'll bear with me as I ask these questions. Mr. Petrozulo, uh, Prince Nayev, the Saudi Interior Ministry, recently stated that, quote, the Jews have exploited, exploited the September 11th events to undermine the image of Arabs before the American people to instigate the latter against the Arabs and Muslims. The question is, who perpetrated the September 11th events and who were the beneficiaries? I think it was the Jews themselves. Mr. Petrozulo, do you agree with Prince Nayev's analysis of September 11th? Can, can, can you put that? Oh, sure. I, I believe uh, you know, bin Laden and al-Qaeda committed that act. I believe, <clears throat> I, I believe that he has admitted to it. And I believe, uh, you know, you know, I mean, I don't know what to add beyond that. Mm -hmm. How about uh, you, Mr. Deshaun? Absolutely not. Mr. Gallagher? I don't believe his statement, Mr. Chairman. Do you believe that uh, that kind of a statement should be condemned? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Mm. Prince Nayev is one of the main officials responsible for tracking down al-Qaeda terrorists inside of Saudi Arabia. 
Now, how can he do a good job if he believes that the Jewish Jews and the Jewish state is responsible for September 11th? Any of you? Sir, I have no personal knowledge of the operations of uh, Saudi law enforcement. My staff received a call Monday from someone named uh, Isha Noklay, Noklay, who describes himself as the legal advisor to the Saudi mission to the United Nations. Do you know, <laughs> do you know if a man named uh, uh, Noklay is a legal advisor to the Saudi mission at the UN? Never heard of him. I've never heard of him, sir. Never yeah, heard Mr. of him, Mr. Chairman. Nakle, uh, Naklo, uh, Nakle, pardon me, told my staff that there are no kidnappings and that international law allows a Saudi father to take his children back to Saudi Arabia regardless of U.S. custody orders. Mr. Petrozulo, do you believe that there are no kidnappings? I believe there have been kidnappings. Mr. Desha? Uh, sir, based on the testimony of the witnesses, yes, there have been children. Mr. Gallagher? I agree with his statement, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Petrozolo, you testified at the last hearing that the Saudi government understood how important this matter was and that they are working hard on it. How is it that, uh, how is it that, po how is it possible if a Saudi legal advisor claims that there are no kidnappings? I mean, how, how, how is that possible? I mean, you have the Saudi, head of the Saudi legal, the, their, the equivalent of, of, of our FBI, and you represent that government. How is it uh, uh, that that's possible if a Saudi legal advisor claims that there, are, there are no kidnappings? Doesn't that show an inconsistency? I mean, you've heard the testimony. You agree there were kidnappings. And the government you're representing says there are no kidnappings. Who, who is this, the legal advisor that says He's this? a man. Uh, we have his letter here. Um, where's his letter? You have a copy of that? I'll put that in the record. Just one second. Hmm? It's exhibit number 25. You don't, probably don't have those exhibits in front of you, do you? Let me have a copy of that. Here we are. His name is Issa. Nokle, he's uh, in New York. He's a barrister at law, and he says that uh, he says that he's legal advisor to the Saudi Arabian mission to the United Nations. And he says there are no kidnappings. And you say you don't agree with that. I've never heard of him. I, I don't. Not. I have no idea what he wrote to you. Well, he represents their government at the, uh, to a degree at the UN because he's a legal advisor to them. You've never heard of him. You testified at the last hearing that the Saudi government understood how important this matter was and that they're working hard on it. Uh, how is it that uh, if they're working hard on it, uh, nothing seems to be happening? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. What's the question? What is the question? You testified that the Saudi government uh, understood how important these kidnappings are and these uh, custody matters are, and that they were working hard on it. How is it that uh, since you were last here, it's been what two months now, mm -hmm. nothing has happened? Yeah, I, I, I believe I testified that the government takes this issue seriously. They have activities uh, going on. There's people and resources dedicated to the issue. The problem is there has been no child, none, returned, not one. There has been no evidence whatsoever that the Saudi government is trying to get these kids back to their mother, who has custodial rights according to U.S. courts, and they were kidnapped from here. So how is it that the Saudi government is working hard on this? You're representing them. You talk to them. You, I imagine you talk to Prince Bendar and, and uh, the others over there. What are they doing that's working hard on it? Yeah, I mean, I, Mr. Chairman, I, we, we all hope and that these cases get resolved. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I, you know, I understand that they're complex cases. I don't know why they're not getting resolved. Well, but, but you said they're working hard on it. What, what evidence do you have that they're working hard on it? 
Um, well, they've, they, that they have people in the embassy working on this, that they have uh, an ad hoc task group in, in Saudi Arabia that's, that, that uh, is dedicated to the issue. I mean, I, I mean, so you have, you have first-hand knowledge then after, or second-hand knowledge from talking to them that they do have people working on this. They've said that publicly. Uh, no, is there any manifestation that, uh, that, that, that uh, they're accomplishing anything? Or are they just buying time? You know, so the, the government has said that they're committed to solving this. Uh, and pull, pull the mic a little closer, would you, Mr. Deschamps? <clears throat> so, sir, the government's made public statements that they're, they're, they're committed to solving this. Um, <clears throat> the foreign minister presented a letter to Secretary of State uh, suggesting the establishment of a working group. My understanding is that the Secretary of State uh, replied. Uh, the embassy has designated two officials in the embassy to work with the State Department. Uh, my understanding, again, secondhand, is that they've been in, in contact, regular contact now, with the State Department Office of Children's Services. These issues have been around for years, as you correctly pointed out. Uh, but we believe that that the the government of Saudi Arabia is. What's that? Yes. Would you pull your mic just a little closer? They can't hear you. Well, the government's also said, uh, uh, according to their uh, the head of their FBI over there, that. Uh, the Jews were responsible for the attack on the United States on September the 11th. And that's, that's, that, that kind of calls into question whether or not they're really, really going at this in an aggressive manner if they're not telling the truth about something as serious as what happened on September the 11th. I mean, uh, I have not. We, you would think that this committee would be the first organization to know if they were uh, really pursuing this. And although they say they've talked to the State Department and they've uh, got some kind of working group. We have heard nothing. We have seen nothing. And we've been constantly trying to get information on this from you folks as well as others. And there's been nothing that we found that shows that there's any movement whatsoever. Well, sir, the State Department's on the second panel, so I'll defer. I'm not going to. Well, we'll ask them about that. We'll ask the mouth. State Department about that. Mr. Nakalo. Uh, also suggests that this investigation is a result of Congress being controlled by the Israeli lobby. Have you heard anything like that, or have they said anything to you like that? Sir, I've never heard of this gentleman. I've never had any contact with this gentleman. This word, the name is never heard. I've never heard this name. Well, we're uh, in the process of contacting uh, the people at the UN to find out what capacity he is in as far as the uh, Saudi government is concerned. At the last hearing, uh, Mr. Gallagher, um, we questioned Mr. Petrozulo about the statement made by Prince Bandar in the Wall Street Journal that some have charged that Saudi Arabia is holding Americans against their will. This is absolutely not true. Mr. Gallagher, do you believe that Prince Bandar's statement is accurate, that no Americans are being held against their will? Mr. Chairman, I believe I, um, I have no firsthand knowledge of that uh, statement, but I do believe, Mr. Chairman, as I stated previously, that in response to your question, that there are cases of kidnapping of children. So then Prince Bendar, who's the ambassador to the United States, when he made that comment to the Wall Street Journal, was not, uh, was not telling the truth. Mr. Chairman, I have no, I've not spoken to Prince Bandar about this issue ever, and I have no firsthand mm -hmm. knowledge as to what information he was given in order to make that statement. I know that you're all in a difficult position when, when we ask you these questions <coughs> because you're, you're lobbyists for the Saudi government and you're getting money from them, and, and, and that's how you make your living. I understand that, and they pay you pretty handsomely. But the fact of the matter is you're the people that represent them and try to make sure they have a positive image here in the United States. Prince Bandar has been the ambassador to the United States for a long, long time. And he said, quote, in the Wall Street Journal, some have charged that Saudi Arabia is holding Americans against their will. This is absolutely not true. That's a categorical statement. No Americans are being held in Saudi Arabia against their will. Now, you guys represent them. You're to put a, a nice face on them. What do you think about that statement that Prince Bandar is making? You're supposed to make him look good and make the Saudis look good. He says that no Americans are being held against their will. Do you think he's telling the truth? You know, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, you know, I, I presume what, what, the, what Prince Bandar was saying in that is that, uh, that you know, 
uh, children born to Saudi parents or Saudi citizens. Um, it's, you know, I, I, and I think that's what gets you know that's part of what gets into the whole complexity of this issue. You, you were here last time, Mr. Yes. Petrozillo, when you had there was a 16-year-old lovely young lady who escaped. Uh, and it was on uh, 60 Minutes, you saw that tape, and she testified that uh, when she was in front of the Saudi or, or the American embassy people over there, she said that she didn't want to come to America, uh, she didn't want to see her mother, she didn't want to come here and all that sort of thing. Uh, and, and then when she was here before the committee, when she was in a free country, in a free world, she said she was afraid they would kill her. She said she was being held against her will. She wanted to come to America for a long, long time, that she was an American citizen. You heard all that. Yes, I did. How can that be interpreted any other way than they're holding Americans against their will? There was a perfect example. I, I, don't, know how, how, I don't know how to respond to that. How, how about you, Mr. Deshaar? Well, sir, I haven't spoken to Prince Bandar about that. I had nothing to do with the production of that document. So I don't know what, what Prince Bandar meant legally by the term, when he used the term, American woman. Well, that was an American woman. She was 16 years old. I mean, you know, she's not, not 21, but she's an American, and we have other American women. I talked to an American woman over there who had two children. I'm not at liberty to give you too much information because this woman gave me some graphic details about how her husband had threatened her. And uh, she told me, put me in a box with my kids, stick me anyth on anything you can, a plane, belly of a plane, and get me out of here. She says he, was, he indicated he would kill her. Now, how can you interpret that any other way than an American and her American children are being held against their will? Well, sir, because of the issues of dual citizenship, that's what makes these, comp these cases so complex, not only in Saudi Arabia, but throughout the world. I mean, yeah, but in, 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 in this is the only country in the world, the only country in the world, where an American woman cannot leave the country if she wants to. She has to get the consent, and so do the younger women. They have to get the consent of the controlling man, usually the father or the husband. So if they want to come to America and they're an American citizen, they have no rights whatsoever, even though they're an adult American citizen. Now, is it, would you consider that being held against their will? Sir, I have no personal knowledge of, of a particular people being held against their will. Did you see the testimony? You said you read all the testimony. I did. Okay. Did you read that testimony? Y yes, sir, I did. Okay. So you, you heard the testimony that was in, in uh, regarding yes, these. You think those people were lying? No, sir. Okay. So you think they were telling the truth? I have no reason to doubt them, sir. You have no reason to doubt them. I think Mr. Petrozillo said the same thing last time. So you have no reason to doubt them, and yet... Prince Bandar, the ambassador to the United States, who's the representative of the, of the Saudi government, said, no Americans are being held against their will. That's absolutely not true. Nah, I, I, I know what the position you're in. You can't say that you think he told a lie. But come on, guys, you represent them. You know he lied. You know he lied. <laughs> and his mouthpiece, what's that guy's name? Al-Jabbar? Al-Jabbar, you know he lied. In fact, on 60 Minutes, you saw that piece earlier where he said he didn't know anything about this young lady trying to get a passport and get out of here. He said, I just heard of it a month ago, and there was a letter that Mike Wallace had that showed it was in 1985 or 6. Huh? 80 what? In 1988, there was a letter signed by him saying, you know, we're not going to do anything about it. He said he didn't know anything about it until a month before. Those guys lie. You're representing people who lie about American people being held hostage. I know you're making a lot of money, and I know you don't like to be here, and I don't like having you here because I know you're pretty nice people. I, I, I know you're nice people. I really do. The reason we're doing this is not to beat the heck out of you guys, but to beat the heck out of the Saudi government by letting, by, by, by letting the American people know that they're, they're paying people who have to make a living here. You guys have to make a living. They're paying American people to put a good face on everything they say, even their lies. Even their lies. And, and the thing that's really troubling is when you know for a fact that terrorists, the majority of the terrorists who've done damage and killed American people came from Saudi Arabia. The vast majority, 15 of the 19. 
that uh, uh, Osama bin Laden is a Saudi, that the, 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 what's the Wahhabis? The Wahhabis are teaching the kids in the school over there to hate Jews and hate Americans every single day. That's what they're teaching, and they have control of the educational system. They are. I was over there. Don't, don't shake your head and tell me they're not teaching them. I know what they're teaching them. And, 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 and they're supposed to be our ally, and they're lying about keeping American citizens in, in, there against their will. And they're, they're paying people here to represent them legally, like Ms. Mahoney, and I'm sure she's a very fine lady and a competent lawyer. And they're paying you guys. And, and, and because we have such a free enterprise system and an open system, they've been getting away with it. And uh, kids are suffering. You know, there's a poem that I read a long time ago called God Give Us Men. It says, God give us men. A time like this demands strong men, tall men who live above the fog in the duty, in public duty and in private thinking, men whom the lust of office cannot buy, men who have determination and a will. You ever hear that poem? Men whom the lust of office cannot buy. And I don't think they, the poem was just talking about people in public service. I think he was talking about people who are paid to mislead, maybe not intentionally, but paid to mislead. And, and the final part of it is wrong rules the land and waiting justice sleeps. Wrong rules the land and waiting justice sleeps. And it's so, it bothers me so much. You know, I heard you say, Mr. Petrozudo, the last time you were here, you know, you would do anything, anything to keep your kid from being kidnapped and held against his will someplace. And I believe that. And I believe that's true of Mr. Deshaw and Mr. Gallagher. I'm sure you guys would do anything to protect your kids and your family. You'd probably take a gun and go out and fight people who were trying to take your kids, and I think that's the way it ought to be. These women had their kids kidnapped, never to see them again, never to talk to them again, except maybe on a rare occasion when pressure is brought to bear. And they were given custody by an American court and the Saudis don't recognize that. <sighs> Mr. Petrozulo, last week I received a response from Prince Saud to a letter I sent to Crown Prince Abdul on September 12th. That's exhibit number 11. The letter makes some pretty surprising claims. First, Prince Saud states that the government of Saudi Arabia had nothing to do with the travel arrangements of the Gashan uh, sisters. Uh, is that true, that the Saudi government had nothing to do with the travel arrangements of those folks? Um, I, I have not seen that letter, so um, maybe I'll take a moment, but... Um, Does anybody, know, did, did, did anybody in your firm get a copy of that letter? No. <coughs> did, do you have any knowledge that the Saudi government was or was not involved in getting, making travel arrangements for them to go to London when we went over there? Do you have any knowledge about that? Um, you know, as I testified last time, I, I didn't know who made the arrangements um, for the trip. I, I presumed it was the government. Hmm. The women did not travel alone. They did have a male contingent with them, though. As, as I understand, their husbands were with them. Yeah, were all their children with them? Um, I, I, I believe so. I'm not sure, but I think hmm. that's right. Do you know who paid for the trip to London? No, I don't. Abdulaziz, uh, Abdulaziz uh, Hussan Al, boy, it's hard to read all these names. Uh, Al Sawaye, the director of the Foreign Ministry's office in the Western Province, wrote in the Saudi in the Arab News Exhibit 18 that the Saudi government paid for it. So the Saudi government paid for the trip, according to what he said in um, the Arab News. Uh, so those women pretty much were in a controlled environment, even though they went to London, in my view. They had men with them, not just their husbands, but others. They were in their abayas. Uh, the minute they went into another room, they took their abayas off. But when the men came back in, they went and sat in the corner, put their abayas back on, and were very subservient to the men and let them answer questions. Not unlike the young woman who testified here that when she was with her dad, she had to say certain things. But when she came to America and was sitting at that table, she told the truth. So we don't know, but we do know that the Saudi government sent them to London paid for them to go to London, made the travel arrangements for them to go to London, uh, 
at the very time that I took a congressional delegation to uh, uh, Riyadh and Jeddah to try to get these women out of there. And so when they said that they hated their mother, they wished she was dead, they never wanted to see her again, when her mother told us that uh, the opposite was true the last time she talked to them, uh, contradicts that. If the Saudi government paid for the trip, how could Prince Saud's uh, statement be accurate? He said they had nothing to do in that letter. In that letter I'm just referred to, he said that uh, the, 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 the Saudi government had nothing to do with making the travel arrangements to go to London. So if the Saudi government did pay for the trip, as was said in the Saudi press, then how can his statement be accurate? This is Prince Saud, the foreign minister. Uh, I don't know how to respond to that. I didn't talk. I didn't see this letter from Prince Saud. I didn't even know he sent one. I didn't talk to him about it bef beforehand. Well, um, let me ask you this: if, if 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 he said they didn't pay for the trip and didn't plan for it, and then it comes out in the paper from a a, a foreign ministry office that it was paid for by the government, would you say that that was untrue? I mean, you got you got the you got the foreign ministry's office in the western province wrote in the Arab News that the Saudi government paid for it, and the foreign minister said they didn't. There's an inconsistency there, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, I would say one would have to go back to Prince Saud and ask him to clarify because he's he's not the kind of guy that I think would just, you know, you know, make misstatements. But um, I, you know, I don't. I don't you have don't it. think he'd lie? I don't. I don't from, from what dealings I've had with him, no, I don't think so. Okay, do you think uh, Prince Mendar would lie? No, I don't think so. You don't think he lied when he said that no Americans are being held against their will? I mean, I think that gets back into the question we talked about earlier about you know. You know, who's a citizen of what country? But I, I don't think he intentionally meant to lie to you or anybody else. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're American citizens. They're American citizens. And they've been kidnapped and taken over there. And they want to come home. So they're held against their will, would you say? We all hope that they do. And, and you, you, they're held against their will. Yeah. So when Prince Bendar says, they're not being held against their will. That's not accurate. Yeah. And when Prince Saud says that uh, the government had nothing to do with sending those women to London when we went to Saudi Arabia so we couldn't work on that issue, <coughs> he's not telling the truth either. Mm -hmm. uh, the letter from Prince Saud also states that the meeting was initiated by the husbands of the two girls themselves. I is that true? I, I do not know. This has been such a highly visible issue, and, and you work with the Saudi government trying to help them with their public relations. You don't know anything about that? You know, as I testified last time, I don't know how okay. the, the trip was organized or who organized it. Mr. Deshauer, do you have any knowledge about that? No, sir, I don't know anything about that. Mr. The Gallagher, do you have any knowledge of it? <clears throat> no, Mr. Chairman, I was not involved in planning, setting up, or any arrangements for the trip. At the committee's last hearing, uh, Mr. Petrojudo, you, you testified that the London meeting was inspired by uh, Adele Algebra and his appearance a couple of weeks prior to where uh, he appeared on the O'Reilly Show and made a commitment to have the Geshean uh, sisters interviewed and meet with the U.S. government officials outside of Saudi Arabia. So which is it? Was the meeting initiated by the Geshean sisters' uh, husbands or was it initiated by Adele Algebra? I mean, he said he was going to do it on the O'Reilly Show and it was done. Yes, Would, would you assume that he did it? As I testified last time, is that as I understood, it was it was my perception that there was a, there was activity, you know, I don't know who is specifically, but there was activity inside you know, the government to try and ha get the sisters to come to America, uh, and they had been trying to do that for some time. Mr. Deshar, Prince Saud's letter concludes that we totally reject anything that damages our Islamic. How do you pronounce that? Sharia. We totally reject anything that damages our Islamic Sharia on which a total system of the state is founded." End quote. It sounds like the Saudi government has staked out a pretty extreme position that does not contemplate any resolution of these kidnappings outside of the Sharia. Would you say that's accurate? Sir, I don't know. I, I'm not an expert on Islamic law. Well, the law. Sharia uh, law says that the man has complete <clears throat> control and that uh, the, the government uh, cedes to him the authority over the family and the women and everything else, and that they, uh, they uh, uh, can't uh, do anything 
uh, without uh, their approval. And he says, quote, we totally reject anything that damages our Islamic Sharia on which the total system of the state is founded. And that is also that they don't recognize anything but it's Islamic law and the law of Saudi Arabia. So if there's an American child born and, and it's an American citizen and a court gives custody to the mother, they don't recognize that at all and so they don't recognize it as kidnapping because the father has complete control anywhere in the world and he can take the child anytime he wants to. Is, is, that, is that pretty much your understanding or do you have any idea about that? Sir, I'm not an expert in Islamic law. Prince Saud states that the, uh, that the law regulates and guarantees all humanitarian rights without pre any prejudices. You think that law protects women's rights without any prejudice? Doesn't sound like it. I, I don't want to continue to put you on the spot with this. But the fact is, they recognize men. They don't recognize women or kids. Ms. Roush McLean, uh, what can you tell us about the Saudi law and how it treats women and children? And does it guarantee your rights if you go over there? And why would Prince Saud make statements that are so plainly false? Sharia law does not protect the rights of American w Christian women at all. I was advised to go to court by the State Department to try to seek custody of my children right after they were taken in 1986. Um, I have absolutely no standing in, in Sharia law, and other American women who have gone to court in Saudi Arabia have lost their children, and then they, they have absolutely no standing at all. We have no standing with Sharia law. Sharia law only upholds the, um, the claims of the father and the male, the male's rule. I, I, I don't remember who it was, but before you answer, Ms. McLean, uh, we had a woman here who was a Christian woman, and she had divorced her Saudi husband and wanted to go see her uh, children, but she was afraid for her life because she had remarried, and if she'd gone over there, uh, according to the uh, Sharia law, uh, she could be uh, an enemy of Islam. That's Joanna Tonetti, an, and she could be subject to the death penalty. Yes, Joanna, correct? Joanna Tonetti, Joanna Tonetti. That she's the lady from Terre Haute, Indiana, right? Yes, Mrs. McLean. Um, I totally reject the statement that the prince made that Sharia law. Um, uh, um, allows people to have hu all their humanitarian rights um, under Sharia law. Very few people, even Saudi women who were born in Saudi Arabia, can lose their children the same way that we've lost our children. If the man over there decides to take the children away from the wife, he can and never let her see them again. So it's not just us American women, it's those Saudi women that live there that don't have any rights under these laws either. No, I understand that, but uh, we, we, we certainly can't get into the problems of the uh, Saudi people themselves. That's something for the government and uh, the religious leaders to deal with. I'm concerned about American women and children. Mr. Petrozulo, uh, earlier Prince Saud sent a letter to the Secretary of State in which he suggested that four American mothers had kidnapped their children from Saudi Arabia to the United States. Do you know if the list that he sent to uh, the Secretary of State was accurate? Yeah. yeah, Mr. Chairman, you asked me about that last time uh, I was here, and I don't know any more than I did last time, which was that I, don't, I hadn't seen the list and I didn't know anything about those cases. I'm not quite sure what, mm -hmm. it, was, what it was referring to. H have you tried to find out anything about that? On, on, those, on those cases, no. Mm -hmm. How about you, Mr. Dishar? Do you know anything about that? No, sir. I had nothing to do Mr. with the preparation Mr. Gallagher, that sir. No, Mr. Chairman, I'd never seen the letter, never seen the list. I asked you at the hearing um, where Mr. Petrozello testified, I asked your counsel in the hall for the list. Um, I've never seen it, but he did inform me that he had seen the list, but I've never seen have it. Have you seen the list? I think you have the list in front of you, uh, the December 27th letter. Or ex excuse me, Exhibit 27. Could, 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 could you take a look at it now, Mr. Gallagher and, and the others, and just see if you're familiar with that? Mr. Chairman, I don't recall seeing that letter. You haven't seen it? Well, what, Jim? Why don't you take a look at it now and see if, do you have any knowledge of whether or not it's accurate or inaccurate? It's, it's from Prince Saud, and as 
the foreign minister, it should be an accurate letter. Would you not say so? Mr. Chairman, I have no firsthand knowledge about where this list came from, who prepared it, and cannot give you an informed opinion about it. Well, I know, but I mean, assuming that the, the, the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia sends a letter to the to Secretary of State Powell saying that four children were kidnapped from Saudi Arabia, you would you would assume he would be telling the Secretary of State the truth, wouldn't you? I mean, you wouldn't think he'd lie to Powell, do it, would you, Secretary of State Powell? I wouldn't. I would not think so, sir. So, but the fact is, it is. It isn't true. It isn't accurate. We've checked that out. There have been no kids kidnapped from Saudi Arabia. We had uh, one case where a child was kidnapped from the United States, and uh, her grandmother uh, sold her house and got two hundred thousand uh, dollars and uh, paid to help her escape which she wanted to do, but that certainly can't be uh, considered uh, uh, kidnapping. The, uh, and two of the cases he, he cited, uh, the kids are still in Saudi Arabia. So that was, uh, that was either an inaccuracy on the part of Prince Saud or it was a lie, one of the two. And I personally think it was probably the latter. And it really is troubling that we know that Prince Bendar has lied. We know that Al Jabbar has lied. And now we're pretty sure that Prince Saud has lied directly to the State Department. These are people that you're representing. Uh, I won't use the term son of a gun, son of a gun. I'll use that instead of what was in the paper. But uh, Al Jabbar was called a lying son of a something in this week's Weekly Standard. When we met with Prince Saud, he was repeatedly dishonest. Prince Naev, who has jurisdiction over child abduction issues, thinks that the Jews are behind September 11th. A legal advisor to the Saudi mission to the UN thinks that Israel runs the US Congress and tells us that there are no kidnappings. We get a list from the Saudi government that lies about children, saying they were kidnapped from Saudi Arabia, and yet, you say everything is going really well, and, you, and, and, and we should trust them and you. And uh, why should we trust them? Why should we trust them that they're doing, uh, they're working very hard to set up commissions and stuff to look into this to bring these kids back home? Why should we trust them after we know the foreign minister lied, Saudi ambassador lied, their spokesman lied, Mr. Al Jaber? Why should we trust them? I don't think you have to answer that. Now, the need for the documents. Ms. Roush, have you ever received assurances from the Saudi lobbyists that they're working on the return of your children and that the Saudi government was working in good faith? Have you ever received anything like that? Have I ever seen anything from... That would indicate from the lobbyists or from the Saudi government that your children, that they're working on trying to get your kids back? They absolutely not. They're not, they're not working on it. They never communicate with me. The only communication they have with me is through my daughters in coercing my, and manipulating Ali and Aisha to go on a trip to London, which they've never been out of the country before in 17 years, and in manipulating the media and the State Department in, and producing and directing a Stalinistic show trial involving my innocent daughters. And Mr. Petrozella was involved in that, and I don't know about the others, but Petrozella certainly was. He had a member of Corvus Communications in the room, in the room with my daughters. They've never been allowed to leave in 17 years. These are two little girls who are grown up and being big girls now and have never been able to breathe the freedom of freedom. And they were taken to a free country, to London, finally. And Mr. Petrozello sits here very innocently and says he doesn't know, he doesn't understand Sharia or, or any of the Saudi laws. Uh, okay, he understood enough to take my daughters to well, London. Let, let me ask Mr. Petrozello a, a, a question. Did you have somebody from your firm there when they were there in London? Yes. Oh, you did. But you don't know any more about it than you just had somebody there? There was a, a young woman for our, our firm who's about the same age as the sisters that uh, was there for one uh, for the interview that uh, the girls had with, um, the with State Fox Depart News, yeah. not with the State Department. Not with, with the with, State. With, was, with, did, with, did you help assist the interview with Fox News? Yes, you did. So you sent somebody over there. Did, did, did what, what kind of knowledge did did you have of this meeting and this trip that they took? If you 
sent somebody over there. You had to know they were going. Who told you they were going? Uh, Al Jaber told me they were going. Al Jaber told you they were going. Did he tell you they were paying for the trip? The government was? Uh, at the time, no, he didn't discuss it. But do you know now that they paid for the trip? I, just what I've read in the paper. Mm. What's that? Did you ask Al Jaber any questions about the trip and what was going on? Um, you know, as I testified last time, um, you know, that the, the, the request was to notify Fox and to provide somebody um, to be there, a woman, young woman, uh, just to be there for the interview, and that's what we did. Did the, did the young lady that went over there have any indication uh, about uh, these, these young women? Were, were, can she, did she tell you that they were with men or by themselves or what? What did, what did she say? I mean, she didn't come back and just say it was a nice trip and that's it. Um, what she said was that uh, they were with their husbands, um, not during the interview, um, uh, but their husbands were there and they, and they were there with, uh, I think, one child, I think. I'm were there sure. any other men there? Uh, she said no. Just the husbands? Yes. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anybody there from the Saudi government other than the husbands? No. Not to, no. You're pretty sure about that? But based on what I've heard, yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. I was told by Mr. O'Reilly's producer, Christine Cotter, that uh, their uncles were there and their father was there also in, in the hotel with my daughters. And if, if, if a woman in Saudi Arabia does something that's not in the, in, 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 agreed to by the husband or the male in the family, what happens to them? They're either killed or tortured. Or beaten. Beaten, tortured, yes. So do you think that your daughters, even though they were out of Saudi Arabia and in London, could freely say what they wanted to say? Absolutely not. My daughters were in a controlled environment, whether they were in Saudi Arabia or they were in that hotel in London. They were totally controlled. You don't think your daughters want to see you dead, do you? My daughters love me very much, and they, they want to be with me in the United States. They told me that when I saw them in 95. And Aisha told me that last year when I was able to talk to her. She said, I love you, Mom. Come here, Mom. Help. And then her father took the phone away from her. Okay, now, let me get this straight. In 1995, they both told you they loved you. Yes. I was and, last year, and last year, your one daughter said, we love you, and oh, the father yes. took the phone away. Yes. How does that square with what was said on... Fox News that they hated their mother and they never wanted to come back and they wish she was dead. You think they could change that fast in a year when they hadn't even seen her? The Saudi government claims that it was uh, just sending uh, your daughters, Miss Rouse, to London so they could speak their mind and, and you've answered that uh, obviously we shouldn't take the Saudis at their word. Do you think it's important that we obtain the lobbyist documents so we can see what really was going on and why they sent your daughters to London? Absolutely. I think these documents are extremely important. I think their email, their communication between them and Joubert is very important when they were organizing the whole thing. I think Petrozella was in on it from the ground floor. I think he, he organized it, he directed it, and, and Joubert and him produced it together. It was a little scheme. Joubert had been trying to make that happen since July after our last hearing when he went to Ambassador uh, Bill Burns of the State Department, and they called me, and I said, absolutely not. But Jaber would not be silenced on this. He wanted it to happen when he met O'Reilly. He knew he could make it happen, and this man beside me here, Petrozello, helped him put the whole thing together. Those documents can be very incriminating to all of three of these people. I, I believe that, sir. The Saudis claim that they're trying to resolve, Ms. McLean, they're trying to resolve the kidnapping of your daughter. Have you seen any evidence whatsoever they're trying to help with that? Turn the mic on, please. Um, I have not seen any evidence of that. In fact, I think they're working actively to make sure that my daughter and I ke are kept apart. Uh, the Saudis and the U.S. State Department deny that the Saudi embassy was complicit in your daughter's kidnapping. The Saudi and our State Department. Do you believe that? Uh, no, I know that they were complicit in the kidnapping of my daughter. Uh, my ex-husband was a part-time employee of the Saudi Embassy as the em assistant imam of the Jonesboro Islamic Center. He was receiving pay from the Saudi Embassy for that position. Um, I sent uh, m all my legal documents to them in 1994 and in 1995. You should have copies of that from a previous hearing. Yeah. Um, they know that um, I had legal custody of her. I reminded them that she was not allowed to leave the country, and they let her leave anyway. You told uh, the Saudis that? 
Yes, I did. And our State Department, did, uh, were they aware of that at that time? I don't really know if they were or not. Do you think the State Department takes the Saudis' assurances uh, regarding kidnapping cases at face value? Well, I think they take them at face value. I think they just believe anything the Saudis tell them. Do either one of you uh, think it would be important if the State Department was confronted with evidence that the Saudis had been misleading them about their actions in resolving these kidnapping cases? Let me answer that, sir. The, the State Department, during the, the records that we found from the subpoena documents from the State Department concerning my case, prove that the State Department has created documents to support their Saudi friends. They've created a number of documents in my case, which are absolute downright lies concerning things that never happened, that I said that never happened, and these documents have come forward. And the State Department would, would, it's not just a matter of not knowing, the State Department defends the Saudi government, and they do everything the Saudi government said, as exemplified by this meeting in London when Joubert gave the order, he wanted the State Department to be there, and they were there, Johnny, on the spot. Ms. McLean, do you think it's important, do you think it would be important if the State Department was confronted with evidence that the Saudis had been misleading them about the, their actions in resolving these kidnapping cases? Uh, yes, I think it would be very important um, because right now it looks like um, the Secretary of State is, um, you know, very close to the Saudis because of his um, involvement on military affairs. Um, and I think that's a conflict of interest with his involvement on children's issues. But I think if he were to see some actual evidence that the Saudis were involved, I would think that he would uh, try to call them to account for it. Uh, I'll ask this of Mr. Petrozulo and, and, and the other two men. Uh, you obviously believe that the committee should not get these records and that we should leave the Saudi government alone to resolve these cases. Uh, do you know how many kidnapped American children have ever been voluntarily returned by the Saudi government? Do you know how many? No. Do you, any of you? I don't have any personal knowledge of it, but, sir, you said none. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I don't have any personal knowledge. In well, Mr. Deshauer is correct. They have never, ever returned an American child that we know of. Mr. Petrozulo, given the track record of your client that they have never returned a kidnapped American child, why do you think that we should accept the Saudis' assurances that they're actually trying to solve this problem by setting up uh, these committees to, to look into it? Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I, you know, I think con constructive dialogue between the two countries is really the only way we're ever going to get any resolution, any progress. Now, well, my question was, given their track record, that they've never, ever returned a kidnapped American child, why do you think we should accept their assurances? I mean, you think a ray from heaven came down and all of a sudden they see the light? Um, I think, uh, you know, in part by the work of this committee, that uh, this, this issue is at the forefront, absolutely. Well, I want you to tell your clients, and I admonished you to do this the last time, tell them this ain't going to go away. I mean, it's, it's just not. We've got, I'm going to a press conference in a half an hour with uh, uh, who's, who's that? Senator Stabenow. And uh, I guarantee you, she's a, she's a, she's a real tough lady. She's, she's a fighter. And she's going to be doing over in the Senate what I'm doing here. And then, of course, I'm not going to go away. And so the Saudis need to know, and since you're representing them, and I think you represent them well, uh, I think they need to know from you as their public relations people that they really need to get on the stick and get some of this stuff resolved. Get it all resolved. Once they get that out of the way, man, they can go on and do some of these other things and have us off their back. Let me just talk to you a little bit about... Uh, about your activities in, in, in your business. Uh, Mr. Petrozillo, you get $200,000 a month from the Saudis. Uh, how much does the Gallagher Group get? Um, Jamie, you want to answer that? Mr. Chairman, for the first six months of this year, I received $5,000 per month. For the second six months, I received $10,000 per month. Okay. So, Sounds like you ought to be getting more if he's getting $200,000 a month. We ought to, you ought to talk to them and say, hey, you guys need to up the ante especially if you have to come up here and listen to me. I mean, that ought to be worth a bunch. How about uh, you, Mr. Deshauer, is it? Sir, my law firm, Patton Boggs, we're currently receiving $50,000 a month. Geez, you, how come he's getting so much more than you? Sir, I, I, I don't know. Well, 
You know, I, you know, I, the thing about her, Mr. Petrozulo, that's really funny is she, last time you were here, I couldn't figure out, you got $200,000 a month and you couldn't remember anything. I thought, man, this is a business I ought to go into. Well, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, let me, let me explain. The $200,000 actually, you know, part of that goes to the firms of these two gentlemen. Oh, really? Yes, as well as to other people who, uh, who provide us with support. Oh, I activities. see. How much do you keep? It varies from month to month. But it's a pretty good hunk. Well, it's, it, it's not inconsistent with what other countries spent. You know, I ought to get out of this job. I mean, there's so much money to be made out there, it's not funny. Other than Patton, Boggs, uh, Orvis, and the Gallagher Group, what other consultants or outside advisors work for the Saudi Embassy? Do you know? Do you know other firms that work for the Saudi Embassy? Um, How many do they have? I mean, you, you, there must be some others. There are other law firms. I think there's some that you pointed out last time, but I, I don't know who you know, the total of everybody that I works. I think they have them. four or five others, maybe. I don't know. Does the Saudi embassy or, or, or their government use any private investigators that you know of in the U.S., or have they ever, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge. You guys have never been involved with them using private investigators? Absolutely, Absolutely not, not, sir. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not, Mr. Chairman. And uh, they have not in the past, to your knowledge? No, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Does the Saudi embassy or their government hire any person or entity to conduct research or investigations regarding its critics or opponents in the U.S.? To do background information, you know, newspapers and stuff like that. I'm not personally aware of any of that. Are any of you aware of any of that? I have absolutely no knowledge of anything yeah. of that sort. Have you ever heard of the Arlington Research Group? No. Any of you? No, no sir. sir. No, sir. What is the Arlington Research Group? Well, that's something we will, we will check upon, I think. Aren't they? Mr. Petrozulo, we began meeting with you in August to discuss individual kidnapping cases and to provide you with information about them so that the Saudi government could begin working to resolve them. Five months later, it doesn't look much like uh, there's been any progress made. Uh, at a meeting with you and uh, Nail Al-Jabbar Al -Jabbar, on August 19th, we pointed out the Reeves case. We informed you that the Reeves children were American citizens, not Saudi citizens, and asked why they're being held in Saudi Arabia. As I recall, the father is from, I know, but the, but the father, or no, the mother was from where? Syria. She's from Syria, so she's not a Saudi citizen. Mm -hmm. So even if you followed the logic of the Saudi government, this is not a Saudi mother. And so uh, the Reeves children uh, are American citizens, not Saudi citizens. And we were asked by, we asked you why they were being held in Saudi Arabia. Mr. Al Jaber indicated that he was puzzled by the facts of the case and he'd try to get answers. Do you know uh, whether the Reeves children are in fact U.S. or Saudi citizens? Do you know anything about that? I don't know. I, I know that the embassy was working on trying to find out an answer to that. I don't know if they've given you an answer or not. Gosh, how long does it take to get an answer? I mean, uh, Al Jaber is a spokesman for the government of Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Saud is the foreign minister. Uh, the, the, the foreign ambassador here is Ben, ben uh, Bendar. You, you think they couldn't pick up the phone and in five minutes find out if this is a Saudi citizen? And yet that, that father has not heard about his two kids that were kidnapped and taken over there. Mm. I mean, this guy's from Syria, or this woman's from Syria. The fact is, she is the uh, daughter of a very important Syrian who has close ties to the Saudis, and so the Saudis are covering up for him. Is it, do you know, have any knowledge about that? Uh, no, no. That's you don't have any knowledge about that? No, I know they're working on it. I think the, I think the parent deserves an answer about uh, what, the, what the citizenship of the child is. Why is it taking so long to get an answer? Do you have any idea? I mean, it's been how many months? How many months are we talking? Five months. Five months when if, if he picks up a phone, he could find out yeah. like that. I wish I had an answer to that. I don't know. Well... Who's this? Oh, Miss Norton, I didn't see you down there. Did you have a comment? I don't want to monopolize it. Did you have a statement you want to make? Well, I have a lot more questions. So I'll, I'll yield to you right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
And I have to thank you once again for demonstrating that when this committee takes hold of uh, such a serious issue, it doesn't uh, do a one-day stand on the issue. The, uh, I, I note that the uh, professionals before us uh, who represent the Saudi government uh, are lobbyists or public relations uh, people. I believe that you are under an obligation to advise your client that your client has a massive public relations problem that is developing into a larger, far more serious problem affecting the relationship uh, between Saudi Arabia and the United States government. Saudi Arabia, <coughs> oil rich and important ally, has gotten used to cushy treatment from successive administrations. All of that, most of that, predated 9-11. The Saudi government is being looked at in a way no one would have perhaps even begun to look at the country uh, before 9-11. And what has caught the attention of the American people in particular, uh, of course, is the uh, large number of Saudis, almost exclusively Saudis, who were the perpetrators of 9-11, which has led us then to look beyond that issue uh, into other matters affecting the relationship between Saudi Arabia and the United States of America. What the Saudis who run an authoritarian regime may not understand is that no president and no Congress can keep an issue that is bubbling up the way this issue is to the American people from, in fact, becoming more serious. Foreign relations is normally the province of the foreign affairs committees and of the president of the United States. But if an issue becomes controversial enough, there is nothing that the President or the Congress can do in a democracy to save them from them, themselves. This has gone, this matter, which involves individual families, looms larger for the, for the average American than the 19 Saudis who, who, who boarded those planes. We're sure that the President and the appropriate committees are, are trying to deal with our safety, uh, looms larger than uh, the great gulf between the way the Saudis generally treat their own population, their women, their children, uh, and the way we treat ours. This now strikes at the gut for the American people. When you're talking about separating mothers and fathers from their children, this is going to be out of the hands of the President of the United States very quickly. Nothing that the uh, very smooth uh, foreign affairs uh, consultant who, who fronts for the government, uh, no papers that they distribute are going to be able to help the government which seeks good relations with our government, if you continue to let this matter get out of hand, the response on the subpoenas, the non-response from the government on these family matters are lighting a slow fire that can ignite at any point. That's how it happens in this country. I don't need to tell you who are sitting, <laughs> seated here at the table who are in the public relations business, that once this thing continues to bubble up the way it is now, it's going to be out of everybody's hands. And it could affect what nobody on this committee is trying to affect. We are not trying to, to, uh, to, we are not trying to affect the normal good relations between the two countries. But in a democracy, when the people become demanding enough, there's nothing we can do because we have to be responsive to the people. And I, I, I am reaching that point 
where the government may be forced to act against its own interest, its interest in keeping an ally for counterterrorism purposes and keeping an ally because we need the oil. All of that could go by the board if the people get angry enough. So if you are in the lobbying business and if you are in the public relations business, you need to have a sit down of the most serious kind with your principles. Uh, by profession, I am a lawyer. And, and in the counsels of a lawyer and a client, you can tell people the honest to God truth. And the honest to God truth is that the Saudi government is messing with our children and our families. And that is where we draw the line in the sand. You got to tell them before this gets out of hand. It is part of your professional obligation as lobbyists for the government, as public uh, relations specialists for the government, to tell them the truth that you may not be able to do anything for them, that their allies within the administration may not be able to do anything for them if we do not come to a far quicker resolution of this problem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate you being here. Let me just ask a few more questions and then uh, we'll let you guys go have some lunch and relax a little bit. Do you know if uh, Al Jaber has made any effort to learn the answers to the questions we've been asking since our August 19th meeting about Reeves? I mean, uh, you, you work with them fairly regularly, I would think. Do you know, has, has Al Jaber said anything or done anything to help with that problem, the Reeves case? Um, oh, no. Well, yes, sir. No. He has? Can yes, you sir. tell me? Can, fact, can you fact, hold, the, hold the mic close, please? Yes, sir. And in fact, uh, we at Patton Boggs, who have had ongoing consultations with uh, both Mr. Wilson and Mr. Cass, I believe we received a letter on or about November 18th uh, with a list of, of questions, um, one of which addressed the Reeves case. And uh, uh, we have gone to the embassy and asked for that information uh, to provide to Mr. Wilson and Mr. Cass. What, uh, what happened? What's happened? Well, one of the things that has intervened, the letter that we got in asking us to directly, and our client has said, you know, one of the, our jobs at and again, we're acting as a law firm, uh, but one of our jobs was to facilitate communications. And uh, one of the intervening things which we had no control of was the month of Ramadan, and then the government was closed for, for uh, Aid. But I believe that in an interim response that we might have provided to, to Mr. Wilson and Mr. Cass, uh, the preliminary indication was is that well, the, the okay, children sorry, are not Saudi citizens. Well, the, 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 the letter or information you received uh, it doesn't satisfy the issue. Uh, are you a little suspicious of Al Jaber not uh, really, I mean, doing much? Or do, do you have any, I mean, do you have any, do you have any uh, uh, idea that he's really pursuing this or is this just a superficial? Well, sir, I, I mean, super as an attorney, the conversations I have with the client are protected by the attorney-client privilege. So all I can tell you is that we received the request and we're pursuing the information. You're saying what uh, what you said is protected by the attorney-client privilege? Well, this is the conversation, sir, I have with the client. Mr. Jabbar? Al Jabbar? Niall Al Jabbar. Who's that yeah, the, Niall Al Jabbar. talking about? Yeah. Well, we don't want to violate the attorney-client privilege. It seems like that there's so much that we can't get to, we can't get to the documents that you folks have that may be relevant to our investigation. And now we can't even hear what, uh, what they may have, uh, may have said regarding the kidnapping of two kids that, uh, that were not, uh, that, not that, that aren't even Saudi uh, citizens. Mr. Petrozulo, has anyone contacted Mr. Reeves' uh, Saudi brother-in-law? He's a prominent uh, Saudi official with UNESCO in Paris. He shouldn't be very hard to track down. This shouldn't take more than a day. 
Has anybody contacted his brother-in-law and talked to him? I don't know. I think you indicated you were going to try to help us with this, didn't you? Uh, yes, absolutely, Mr. Chairman. And, and we have tried to be as cooperative as we possibly well, can. What have you done to be cooperative? I, I, well, you know, I certainly relayed all of your requests to, from the last time I testified. To Mr. Jaber and, and, and uh, yes. Uh, yes. Ambassador uh, Bendar. So you gave him the message. Yes, I think I did. they probably saw the message anyhow, don't you think? Probably so. Yeah. This is probably late night TV for them. At the last hearing you attended, uh, you heard testimony from uh, Marine Dabao. How do you pronounce her name? Dabao. Marine's daughter has been missing for 10 years and she doesn't even know where she's being held. Has the Saudi government uh, located Nadia, uh, her daughter? I don't know. I, I mean, you relayed that to them too? Yes. And, and you know, Mr. Chairman, since the last time I testified, I've had no involvement in any of, the, any of these. I think, you know, that the activities that uh, Mr. Deschauer just described, you know, was what has been, been carried forward, but uh, I wish I could be more helpful. Well, I, I have to tell you that uh, these hearings seem like an exercise in futility because we just keep going round and round and round and nothing really changes. But I think what the delegate from Washington said is very true. Uh, it isn't going to go away. I, 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 I don't think members of this committee, even those who aren't here today, are going to let it go away. I will keep bringing it to their attention. And uh, I'm not going to be chairman next year. I'm sure you guys all know that. But I think I can convince my successor, when necessary, to issue subpoenas. And I probably will be a subcommittee chairman, and I will make sure that this area is in my subcommittee's jurisdiction. Either that or, since I'm also one of the senior members of the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, I'll do it over there. But one way or the other, we're going to stay after this. Uh, I want you to know that uh, I, I know you guys do a good job up here for a lot of your clients. And I didn't bring you up here just to beat the heck out of you. But what I wanted to do was to make the case that the Saudi government, and you've got to be careful, I know, because they're paying you. And if you say the wrong thing, they're going to cut you off. But the fact is, they have lied and lied and lied to this committee. They have lied and lied and lied to these mothers. They have... Uh, 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 been roadblocks to getting American citizens back in this country, and it's something that, that will not be tolerated, and we're going to keep the heat on them until something happens. It may be that they never bring these kids back, but I think the end result will be, and I hope that uh, Mrs. Prince Bandar may be watching. If you're watching, wish you the best. But uh, I hope Prince Bandar will realize that uh, ultimately uh, either we'll start getting some results or this will have a devastating impact long term on the relations between the Saudi government and the United States. There's other places we can get oil. We can expand the amount of oil that we're getting from Venezuela. We can do more research here, and the President wants to do that in the Anwar and elsewhere. We can buy oil from the Soviet Union. There's a lot of places we can go, and if we keep the pressure up here in Congress, and I intend to do that, there will be some changes made. So this is much, for, much far, further reaching than just these kids and these women who've been kidnapped and are being held against their will. So the Saudis need to know that there will be, there will be a price to pay for this, Prince Bandar and Prince Saud. There will be a price to pay for this long term if they don't get on the stick and get this job done. And since you guys represent them, uh, and I'm sure they'll know about this, but I hope that you will convey that uh, you, 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 I know Mr. Gallagher has known me since I was the vice chairman of the Republican Study Committee. You, you know that. Yes, and I'm the founder of the conservative action team, which is now the new Republican Study Committee. Yes, sir. And so you know that I, that, that I usually follow through on what I'm saying. So tell them that we're going to keep pushing on this. Okay? Okay. I ask unanimous consent that a letter from Hill and Nolan dated December 10th, 2002 regarding last week's hearing be included in the record without objection so order. I want to make one more thing clear, and that is Ms. Senator Lincoln is the one that uh, is working with me in the Senate uh, on this issue, on the Saudi issue, and not uh, Representative Stabenow. I'm working with her on something else, so I had that backwards a while ago. But Senator Lincoln, make no mistake about it, she's determined on this issue as well. Mm -hmm. Ms. McLean, Ms. Roush, thanks again for coming up here. 
I know it's a tough thing for you to keep coming back, but we really appreciate it. And uh, we won't quit. We won't quit. Thank you very much. I have some questions I'd like to submit for the record for you. If you take a look at those, we'd appreciate it if you'd answer them. Ms. Mahoney, you're a great barrister, uh, but uh, uh, I, 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 I'm disappointed that you're going to be one of the roadblocks if we move a contempt citation if we don't get these documents because uh, I know it will tie this up for a long time and I think those documents are very relevant to getting these kids back. So it, it, it troubles me, but I know you got to do your job. With that, we stand, stand adjourned. Next on C-SPAN, Homeland Security Director Tom Ridge talks to state legislators. Then a news conference with a coalition of groups opposed to war with Iraq.